The Anderson Language and Technology Center at CU Boulder is committed to broadening and deepening cultural understanding. Alltech offers non-credit language classes in person and remotely to everyone year-round. Our flexible and engaging format makes language learning a breeze for anyone. So join a community of like-minded and motivated students who are passionate about traveling and experiencing the world. Jump into our summer session with a 20% discount using the code ALLTECHFUN. Learn more at alltech.colorado.edu. My name is Tatum Verbrugge. I studied political science and international affairs at CU Boulder. In this panel, you will hear discussion about one of the most important issues that the U.S. is currently facing, policing and police violence against people of color. The events in the past year have made it clear how important it is to have a meaningful dialogue about this issue. So on our panel, we have several experts with a range of perspectives from both within law enforcement and outside the system who will discuss how to change the role of law enforcement to end police violence and promote community well-being. Thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the panel. I'm sorry for the pause there, can you hear me? If you can hear me, we're having a few technical difficulties. Bear with us, please. There we go. I think we're on good. Panelists, can you hear me okay? Good, thank you. Sorry for that delay. Well, hello. This is the uh, 2020, uh, 2021 Conference on World Affairs panel for Friday, April 9, entitled Policing in America, Now What? This panel is being broadcast on YouTube live from the University of Colorado in Boulder. A recording will be available on the YouTube CWA channel immediately after this panel ends. My name is Bob Yates and I will be your panel moderator. Since 2015, I have served on the Boulder City Council, whose responsibilities include establishing budgets and policy for the Boulder Police Department. I'm a lawyer by training, having worked 25 years in private practice in the corporate world before retiring to dedicate my time to community service here in Boulder. I think this panel on policing is timely for our city here in Boulder, for the state of Colorado, and for the nation. Locally here in Boulder, two years ago, there was an incident involving a black university student who was inappropriately confronted by a police officer. <clears throat> Fortunately, no injuries or arrests occurred, but the police apologized to the student and the officer is no longer with the police force. That incident followed an in independent report that showed that the Boulder Police Department confronted and cited people of color at a much higher rate than white people. Together, these two situations led our city council to the formation of an independent civilian police oversight panel and the appointment of an independent police monitor. The civilian oversight panel and the police monitor have the authority to review complaint investigations involving police officers and to make disciplinary recommendations to our chief of police. The civilian panel is also charged with making policy recommendations for the police department and training suggestions. More than half of those on the civilian oversight panel are people of color, even though the, that people of color make up only about one eighth of Boulder's population. <clears throat> and of course, here in Boulder two weeks ago, we suffered tragic losses when 10 of our friends and neighbors, including a Boulder police officer, were killed in a mass shooting at a local grocery store. I encourage you to tune into a CWA panel this afternoon at two o'clock mountain time, at which our keynote speaker, Shannon Watts, and our Congressman, Jonah Goose, will discuss ending gun violence in America. 
At the state level here in Colorado, the Colorado State Legislature is considering a bill in this current legislative session that would make significantly um, changes to the power of police departments throughout the state of Colorado in making certain arrests for misdemeanors and low-level felonies. The concept is that if there are fewer arrests, it will reduce discrimination against people of color in confrontations with the police. The bill here in Colorado is highly controversial with police departments, sheriff departments, district attorneys, and cities scoring off on different sides of the proposal. There will likely be a vote on the Colorado bill in the coming weeks. Finally, at the national level, we are all watching with great interest and concern the murder trial of the Minneapolis police officer charged with the killing of George Floyd. A verdict on the case is expected before the end of this month. Given all of these current events, I compliment the Conference on World Affairs for pulling together this timely panel on our local, state, and national debate over the role and responsibilities of police in our society. In a few moments, I'll introduce our panelists. They will each make opening remarks for about five minutes. We'll then encourage them to engage with each other before taking questions from our audience. We'll end this panel at 12.15 Mountain Time. You can submit your questions to me at any time, including during opening comments through the YouTube chat function. If you do offer a question, please let us know where you're watching from. And if you are a student, please tell us that because we try to give students priority with questions. And now to our speakers. Our first speaker is James Bell. He's a Conference on World Affairs Veterans, last visiting Boulder as a conference panelist in 2018. James is the founder of the W. Haywood Burns Institute, which has worked throughout the United States and around the world to build equity in the administration of justice. That work took James to South Africa, where he assisted the African National Congress in the administration of the juvenile justice system in that country. James lives in Oakland, California, and James and I share in common something we both attended Hastings College of Law in San Francisco. James, would you please lead us off? Thank you, can you hear me? Great, thank you. Um, I think somebody unmuted me, so I just wanted to make sure that I was um, being heard. So. First of all, let me um, thank um, CWA for um, dealing with this topic. Let me thank my colleagues and fellow, fellow panelists um, for being um, a part of this discussion. And let me send um, solidarity um, um, to the community in Boulder for what they have just endured. So my remarks are that changing law enforcement as suggested by the workshop title, I believe, starts with us and not them. Them, they, as law enforcement, are funded, protected, and instructed with our permission and blessing. They do what they do in our names. And it is wildly different what they do in our names in different places. And this is because we have not reached consensus as a society on the best way to be kept safe. However, from the creation of the first police force in Boston in the early 1800s, we know that the fundamental pillar of safety has to be the protection of privilege. It is that privilege that Ms. Amy Cooper weaponized by calling the police because quote, she was being threatened by an African-American man. She understood all too well what our societal mandate to law enforcement is. And that is whiteness has a status that is paramount and blackness must be controlled severely because it is scary, violent, and dangerous. No matter how one tries to pretty it up, it's just that basic. Research, studies, anecdotal information have shown whiteness is considered order and blackness is considered chaos, disorder, and should be controlled. Now, generally order and safety have always been defined by elites and those with money and power. To me, it is fair to observe that when elected officials and other power brokers of the time decided to establish police forces, they conflated two 
distinct functions into one. And that is to deliberately combine social control under the guise and pretense of crime control. Social control meant that law enforcement would be used to protect the hierarchical structures of human discourse that determine who would be subject to abuse and who would be protected from harm. Crime control meant addressing the behaviors deemed criminal by that human hierarchy, such as drunkenness, prostitution, and theft, just to name a few. The result is that police forces were created to maintain safety by protecting the privileged elites that created and empowered them from the beginning. It is a sophisticated approach to combine crime control with social control. I say it is akin to policing crabs in a barrel without asking who decided that putting crabs in a barrel was a good idea in the first place. So after seeing the stark reality of the policing we have built and too often sanctioned, voices that have remained silent in the past are beginning to speak up and ask for change. However, real world concrete suggestions of alternatives to policing as we know it are few and far between, and many of them are ham handed. We have seen the ineffectiveness of tools and technologies to improve policing so far. Those would be cultural competence training, implicit bias training, procedural justice practices and body cameras have not been transformative because they ignore the fact that policing was built to do the unpleasant job of maintaining structural racism, thereby insulating the elites from the impact of their instructions to law enforcement. Therefore, what I propose for the panel is nothing will change until we give the law enforcement industry a new mission. We need to imagine how to reduce the footprint while providing for well being in our communities. 300 years of social control will not be eliminated overnight and must be thought through carefully. And it must be co designed with law enforcement, community members, victims, and perpetrators. It is not being widely pursued, but some serious cities are seriously examining how community well being can be maintained without custody control and suppression and use of force as its basic fundamental approach. They are examining while 911 is being used as the Amazon of government services. People are calling 911 with headaches. They are building alternative teams for responses, incentivizing different behaviors, etc. So the question this panel deals with is, aren't we smart and humane enough to imagine and implement ways that promote, com promote excuse me, community well-being equitably? Are we trapped by a history that subjugates one group over another? I hope not. And through these panels and other deliberations, I think we can think about how we can have safety and structural well-being operating in the same sentence. So thank you for your time. Thank you, James. Our second speaker is Merrick Bob. Uh, Merrick joins the Conference on World Affairs for the first time this year from Los Angeles. Merrick is the founder of the Police Assessment Resource Center, which provides independent evidence-based counsel on effective account accountable policing throughout the country. Merrick serves as a federal court-appointed monitor to oversee the implementation of a consent decree with the city of Seattle in its efforts to address excessive force and discriminatory policing. Like James, Merrick is also a lawyer by training, having attended our law school's arch rival across the Bay, the University of California, Berkeley. Merrick? Thank you very much. And uh, I'm delighted to be here, delighted to have this opportunity to speak with you all and uh, to participate. I congratulate CWA on pulling together an absolutely fantastic uh, program uh, with many individual parts that are going to be uh, extraordinarily interesting. My perspective is as uh, 
Bob just said, uh, an outside perspective. I'm not a police officer. I've never been one. Uh, I'm a lawyer by training. And I first got involved in policing uh, several decades ago at the time of the Rodney King incident in Los Angeles when a group of lawyers selected by Warren Christopher was put together to examine and analyze the LAPD and try to figure out what was wrong. I've gone on and since that time have served as a monitor or a counselor uh, or an investigator uh, for 20 or more large cities in the United States and have some sense of the kind of program that you have to initiate in order to better administrate discipline and to inculcate the kinds of values that uh, James Bell was just telling us about. One, you have to make certain that there is an honest, fair, thorough and complete system for analyzing whether or not officers have committed misconduct. And if so, uh, whether they receive discipline for having done so. Uh, a lot of times those efforts are frustrated. We see time and again, the pain of police departments and having to have certain miscreants rejoin their ranks because of a decision by some arbitrator uh, that uh, the chief was somehow wrong in uh, seeking to terminate the services of a given officer. We need to do a number of things that are going to be proposed in the Colorado legislation. We need to do away with uh, uh, those, those things that uh, protect the officer. Uh, qualified immunity has to go. An officer has to understand that he or she very much is at risk of personal loss if they violate the Constitution. We need to have procedures such that citizens and others within the community are the ones who ultimately, ultimately make the difference and ultimately make the decision about what kind of policing we want. They're the ones who, in my view, need to decide ultimately uh, what, disciplinary, what discipline is to be imposed. And finally, there needs to be some kind of ongoing review board, oversight board, Board of Police Commissioners, you can call them whatever you want, but basically a group of citizens uh, that are empowered by mayoral appointment or otherwise to set the policy and the procedures in the department, to work with the department certainly and work with the chief of the department clearly but ultimately uh, the responsibility for setting the policy and the, and the uh, uh, procedures of the department lie with this civilian non-police, non-military group. Usually these groups are aided and assisted by inspectors general and an inspector general uh, in Denver uh, in the person of Nick Mitchell has been a very, very strong, positive uh, uh, thing. Sorry to be losing him uh, in Denver. Uh, but people like him and his predecessors and others around the country uh, need, to, uh, need to serve as monitors or inspectors general. Happy to follow up on all these uh, all these themes as we go forward. Thank you, Merrick, and we certainly will. 
Our third speaker is um, Daniel Hahn. Daniel is also a first time CWA participant. We welcome him virtually to Boulder, Colorado. Since 2017, Daniel has served as the chief of police of Sacramento, California, the first African-American to serve as police chief in Sacramento's 170 year history. With a distinguished 30 year career in policing, Daniel leads a police department of 800 officers with an emphasis on community policing and building trust in Sacramento's diverse community. A lifelong Sacramento resident, Daniel frequently shares his story of being adopted as an infant and how that family's nurturing environment molded him. And Daniel talks about his arrest at the age of 16 for allegedly assaulting a police officer. While ultimately no charges were brought, Daniel shares how that incident changed his life and how a few years later, he became a police officer himself. Chief. Thank you. Um, and thank you for having me and thank you for um, putting this panel together. I think uh, this will be a robust uh, discussion, maybe with some disagreement and explanation on the disagreement, which I think is what we need in this country that we don't always have. So it's my pleasure to be on this panel and also my thoughts go out and heart goes out to Boulder as they are uh, dealing with a tragic situation that seems to happen all too frequently in our country. Um, you mentioned some of my background. I think there's some things in my history that um, are a little bit unique for somebody in my position. I grew up in what most would consider an inner city neighborhood um, that was one of the highest crime neighborhoods when I was growing up during the crack epidemic. Um, my street corner uh, was where my house was, was one of the um, more um, frequent in uh, prostitution strolls with what we called it at the time and during the that period of time there was daily 24 hours a day drug dealing going on in and around my block. Um, I was as you mentioned arrested at 16 for assault on an officer and me nor anybody I knew ever even crossed our mind to become a police officer. We didn't know any police officers. There was no police officers that lived in our community or uncles or relatives or friends that any of us knew. Uh, my younger brother who had fought in Desert Storm in the army um, had gotten addicted to drugs after he got out of the army and I was a police officer by that time and uh, he was murdered in the drug trade basically in downtown Sacramento in my beat on my shift and I responded to the call and identified him and had to call my mom and let her know that her youngest son had died. And I bring that up because um, I look at my younger, we were the youngest in the family. So we shared a room growing up and um, he, I got in way more trouble growing up than he ever did. And he wanted to be a veterinarian, but at some point he starting in the military started using drugs and uh, eventually became addicted to them and got on a different road than his original road. And so if you had met him in his 20s as a police officer, you might've thought he was a criminal um, that was harmful to the community, which those are true, but not entirely true about who he was. When I think about him, I think about us growing up and I don't think about those years. And so the reality is if we were able to get him back on his original road, uh, we would be talking much differently about him. So um, I think all too often we uh, are very, much too narrow in what we talk about when we talk about law enforcement and community. And so do, we do need to talk about legal things. We do need to talk about technology and equipment and training for police department, but we also need to talk about culture and not just culture of law enforcement, but culture of society. And so I've done years of research and I continue to do research on our history, the history that we were never taught, the history we weren't taught in high school or college. And I teach that to all of our officers. I teach that with our community. I teach that to different groups because it's important to understand how we got here. And I heard a couple of the panel members kind of reference some of what I'm talking about because there's a reason why we're here now. And we don't talk about the truth and we don't know the truth about how we got here too often. So we often miss the mark of how we're gonna get better. And I just wanna use two examples of how we don't tell the truth. So I often hear over the last year that these protests, these riots, these um, times of unrest are unprecedented times in our country. They're absolutely not unprecedented times. We've been here before. We've been here hundreds of years before, worse 
Uh, cities have burned before, people have died before, riots have happened before for the exact same reason that they're talking today. The Watts riots, the Atlanta riots in the early 1900s, and the list goes on and on. The protesters, the rioters, the people that are fighting for something to change said the exact same things then that they say now. We've never fixed it because we don't even know how we got here. And then lastly, um, the other thing I would, uh, just as an example of how we don't deal with the truth, I often heard at the insurrection at the US Capitol that that was like a third world country and they named off different countries. That was not like a third world country. That's the United States of America. This is a great country, but that is us. That is who we are. Those were our folks breaking into our capital and we don't deal with it. We like to uh, hide our dirty little secrets and we need to talk about those things. And if we only focus on law enforcement and by all means we need to change and we're doing a lot of things in the Sacramento Police Department to deal with these things. But if we only talk about law enforcement, we are gonna be here again over and over like we have for the last couple hundred years. So my pleasure to be here and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Chief. And finally, to ensure that our panel today is not exclusively folks from California, we're joined today by speaker Alex Vitale, who joins us from Brooklyn College. Professor Vitale teaches sociology and at the same time is the coordinator of the Policing and Social Justice Project at Brooklyn College. The project is a collaboration of faculty, students, and community-based organizations that uses research and advocacy to produce safer and more just communities. Allow me to quote a passage from Alex's book, The End of Policing which I think frames nicely our panel today. In that book, Alex wrote, the problem is not police training, police diversity, or police methods. The problem is the dramatic and unprecedented expansion and intensity of policing in the last 40 years, a fundamental shift in the role of police in society. The problem is policing itself. Alex? Thank you, Bob, and thanks everyone there for inviting me. I'm only sorry that uh, we can't all be together in person. I have a, a family there in Boulder and nearby in Denver, and of course was uh, very upset by the recent uh, events there. And I, I wish you all well in trying to chart a path forward to hopefully prevent these kinds of things from happening in the future. Well, James, or at the beginning outset, really stole a lot of my thunder. I, I and more eloquently and clearly than I could possibly hope for. So maybe I'll use this opportunity to try to uh, get into a, a few more of the particulars. You know, this summer's protests under this banner of, of defund the police while that may be an imperfect term in and of itself to capture everything that the movement stands for, it does communicate very clearly a rejection of the idea that we're going to reform police, that we're going to change the culture of policing, that we're going to make police more accountable. Instead, it demands us to think very concretely about the ways in which we can reduce the scope and intensity of policing, as Bob mentioned in the, in the quote from my book, that we've come to rely on police for entirely too much, and that we have very clear ideas about what we could do differently. You know, the officers involved in the killing in George, of George Floyd had had all the police reform we could think of. The, Minneapolis was a shining star of the kinds of procedural reforms that were laid out by President Obama's task force on 21st century policing. Those officers had had implicit bias training de-escalation training, mindfulness training, were wearing body cameras, were operating under a new use of force policy, were operating under a new early warning system to identify problematic officers, were operating under a new policy that required officers intervene if they saw misconduct by a fellow officer. And none of it made any difference. George Floyd's life did not matter to them. And the culture that produces that kind of behavior is actually integral to the nature of policing, both in terms of the long 200 year history of policing that, that both Daniel and James alluded to, but also in the very current mission that we've given police. 
over the last 40, 50 years, what we've done is we've systematically defunded social services and the basic social safety net under the guise that if we just subsidize the already most successful parts of the economy, that, that they will become so successful that their, their wealth will trickle down and benefit everyone. But instead of trickle down, what we've seen is the rise of mass homelessness, mass untreated mental health and substance abuse problems, failed institutions like schools, mass involvement in black markets of drugs and sex work and stolen goods out of profound economic insecurity. And then rather than addressing these issues, our elected officials have turned those problems over to police to manage. This wasn't a decision that police officers made or police commanders made, this was a political decision. And police have been put in an untenable situation of trying to be all things in all situations. And it just isn't possible. And the way to move forward on this is not to give police more money for training, more money for new technology, or to tinker with uh, systems of accountability. Qualified immunity seems like a silver bullet. If we could just get officers to be personally financially responsible for this miscon their misconduct, that would solve the problem. But the problem is so much deeper than the high profile one-off incidents that we see. There are literally millions of harmful and unnecessary arrests occurring every year that are completely lawful, procedurally proper, and unbiased. The war on drugs has, for instance, has put millions of people in prison for no good reason and no amount of police reform or enhanced accountability will change that. We need to get police out of the drug business. Voters in Oregon have moved to do just exactly that. And this is the way forward to both reduce the scope of policing and to invest in the kinds of community-based strategies that are gonna make people safer and healthier. We need more counselors in our schools. We need high quality community-based mental health services. We need medically-based drug treatment options. We need community-based anti-violence programs to support families in crisis, to mentor young people, to help resolve their situations so that they don't turn to violence. So I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Well, I heard, um, I heard uh, among the four of you, um, maybe a common acknowledgement of some of the problems, but I, I heard um, some different solutions. So I wanna kind of drill into that and get you guys talking amongst each other. Um, so, so Daniel, I'll start with you. I, I heard Merrick call pretty boldly for elimination of qualif qualified immunity and to hold police officers personally and criminally liable for their misactions is one of the solutions. So Daniel, do you think that this will make it hard to recruit um, new police officers or retain existing ones? Well, first, let me say, I don't think that will solve anything. Um, it might be needed. It might be uh, a decent thing to do for other reasons, but it won't go to the heart of what ails us, which I talked about earlier that is rooted in our history. Um, I, and, and whether uh, I think qualified immunity will even uh, achieve what I think it possibly could depends on the, the details, um, which we usually don't talk about. So I don't know what that means. Does that mean officers can buy insurance like maybe doctors and things like that? And if so, how much does that insurance cost? If say an officer makes $2,000 a month and the insurance costs $1,500 a month, then we'll never recruit another officer ever. They're not getting paid enough. So I don't know the details between each uh, individual state or uh, community that's talking about qualified immunity, but the, the devil's in the details. And so, I mean, the men and women that wear a uniform, they have to make a living. They have to support their family. So it just, it just means uh, it d depends on what the details are, but that by itself, just like nothing by itself, will have a significant impact in what we're challenging. It could have some negative impacts also. Thanks, Chief. Merrick, before I give you a chance to rebut what the Chief just said, I wanna remind our audience that uh, we're receiving questions now uh, through the, uh, the chat function of YouTube. Uh, feel free to post your questions. Uh, please let us know where you're, um, you're watching from. And if you're a student, please let us know that so we can give you priority. Merrick, what do you, what do you think about what, uh, what Daniel just said? Well, with all due respect, um, I, I, I must say that I disagree with it. Uh, I think that 
And, and here's where I may differ with a number of people on this panel. I believe the police reform is still possible. I believe that if a police department adapted a number of strategies uh, and reformed themselves along the lines of what's required in a consent decree by the Justice Department, they would be providing the kinds of service that Messrs. Bell and Vitali and Hahn would have us see them do. I'm not quite as pessimistic, though I do believe that nowhere near enough attention has been paid to how the officer performs the job, whether the officer is performing that job as the community would have that officer do it, and what is going to happen in the wake of that. So qualified immunity is not, in and of itself, the only step to take. It is one of a number of uh, reforms that need to be implemented in order to get a reformed and positive police department. But I don't think I don't think it's impossible. I think I think one has to pay a great deal of attention to what Alex said about looking carefully at what the police does and separate out those functions that are true law enforcement, criminal law functions from those that are better handled by people with mental health uh, and psychology backgrounds who are better at dealing with people one-on-one -on -one and when they present certain kinds of problems, those aren't police department, uh, police problems. Similarly, the police don't need tanks and don't need uh, military equipment uh, in order to do their job. Uh, the police are not the army and never have been intended to be that and need to get out of that business, in my view. Thanks, Mark. James, you've been waiting patiently. Um, we've, we've heard it said now by a, a few speakers that we, we ask our police to do too many things, that we, 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 um, we should narrow their scope and their responsibilities. What do you, what do you think about that? So thank you, um, and um, interesting conversation. Um, I just uh, um, really appreciate Chief Han um, and the kind of structure that Alex gave us in this conversation. I tried to do a similar thing. So I started off by saying, it's not them, it's us. And it is because we, they are, what, what, what Chief Han and his colleagues all across the country in the 19,000 cities that make up the United States, they are doing what the public has asked them to do. And that's what I love the way Alex framed this, is that they, they are doing what in our names what we've asked them to do. And I believe, as the chief in Dallas said, you're asking us to chase dogs um, in the jurisdictions that we've been in. We've looked at 911 calls and literally, when I say that the police are becoming the Amazon of government services, the, the overwhelming amount of calls are for public disorder and domestic disputes. Now, I just believe we are a country that if that ends up being, I don't know, in depending on your jurisdiction, you know, 3,000 calls a year or something, that we can have teams of people that aren't law enforcement that come with guns, uniforms, and patrol cars to handle those situations. And so, yes, I believe that we as a public are asking them to do too much. I wanna also throw in that I don't believe this is a red or a blue issue. I believe that this is a matter of elites that want a certain situation and not. I live in San Francisco. There are 4% black people here and we are locked up at 48% in the jail. Now you're not gonna get a city more blue than San Francisco, but those numbers, just like New York City, all the blue places have the same issues of social control. 
And so what I think Chief Han is talking about when he's talking about the history is what I tried to say is that we have asked law enforcement to do social control of the other under the guise of crime control. And so we do need crime controlled, but so much of what has been asked of them is really social control, meaning to suppress them from um, um, the, the natural um, social intercourse that the elites wanna make sure they have. And so I just think that until we begin to discuss the, I think we're all, we not maybe all not in agreement, but until we basically discuss what it is we're asking law enforcement to do in order to deliver us safety, then we're going to continue to try to do these anecdotal fixes that aren't gonna work. And a part of that conversation has to include the people that do harm and the people who are harmed. Because in the neighborhood that, that Chief Han comes from, he knows very well, one day you're the, you know, one day you're the bug, the next day you're the windshield. The line between perpetrator and victim is very thin in communities of concentrated poverty. And so I think we need to have everybody in that conversation about how we're best kept safe in neighborhoods of underemployment and, and lack of opportunity. Thanks, James. And audience members, uh, this is a great time for you to get your questions. And I see some questions are already starting to roll in. We'll go to audience questions here in a couple of minutes. But before we do, I want to turn it back to Alex. Because Alex, you really kind of kicked this off, this discussion of solutions and and uh, refocusing what the police um, do. And and um, it sounds very easy and elegant you know, when you, when you speak about it and we talk about uh, uh, mental health and some of the other issues that police are called on to engage in and, and we should shift police away from some of those things. But as an elected official, I struggle a little bit with how that actually works in practice. So let's get down to some practical solutions that elected officials who may be listening can, um, can actually implement. So we, we have some new polling data that just came out, the appeal published that show that something like 63% of Americans think that police should not be in the mental health business and that we need to actually invest in non-police, both critical crisis response, but also baseline community services. And the reality is this takes up a significant part of the daily work of police officers. Here in New York City, the NYPD go on almost a quarter of a million of these calls every year. It's about 600 a day. Every officer is essentially spending part of their day managing these calls. We need to take that burden away from them, free up the resources that the police were using to manage this and the jails and reinvest that money in community-based strategies. This is what they're trying to do in Los Angeles, what they've recently done in Denver with the STAR program. This is a very concrete intervention. We have data that shows that it works. In, in Oregon, there's a group of communities that are doing this. They're diverting 20% of all 911 calls now to these non-police services at a savings of eight and a half million dollars a year. And that doesn't even include the savings of jails and emergency rooms that are accruing as well. We're seeing a growing number of communities that are rejecting school policing. Oakland, one of the most recent ones, decided that this is not the way that they want to handle school discipline issues. It's extremely effect, expensive and ineffective. We have brand new research out just today uh, uh, on the Crime Report website showing that these interventions don't work. They don't make our kids safer, that having more counselors, restorative justice programs, wraparound services for young people and their families when they're in crisis is what actually produces a safe and successful learning environment. But it also includes things that maybe James might be referring to when he says crime control. Because of course, what is what we call crime, right? We've, we've manufactured this category of crime and then imagine that things like violence are of course the purview of police. But there's a growing awareness that police are not the right tool to manage family disputes, intimate partner violence, that we need 
preventative strategies. We need resources so that families can fix their problems rather than being continually visited by a police officer with that constant threat of violent escalation and even death. We have a youth violence problem in parts of this country, but gang suppression policing has been a horrible failure. It has led to police corruption, abusive prosecutions, excess police violence, and the gangs continue to just chug right along. We need community-based anti-violence strategies that view young people through a lens of respect, that understand that they have been traumatized and are struggling and to try to work with them, not against them. So I want to bring this back to race, because um, I know that the students who put the, this panel together really wanted us to focus part of our time on, on, on the relationship between um, the police and, uh, and people of color and the disproportionate number of people of color who are arrested uh, in, our, in our communities. And so it sounds like there's a fair amount of, of agreement consensus here around uh, getting police out of certain um, uh, aspects of what they're now called on to do, including mental health. How, how will narrowing the scope of, of police uh, improve um, relations between the police department and uh, uh, people of color in our communities? How, how, and this is a jump ball question, anybody jump in, but uh, I wanna understand how narrowing police focus will actually um, improve um, the, uh, the disproportionate effect that people of color uh, have uh, in, in police interactions. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll jump in on that. Um, I think we just have to understand, not just in our country, but in the history of the world, uh, the enforcement arm of society or the dominant group uh, or the group that makes the decisions in society, the enforcement arm in any society is military and law enforcement to what James was talking about earlier. And so we get what we asked for. That's why I say in Washington, DC, that was America. It's happened before, not necessarily at the Capitol, but those sort of intentions and ideologies have been around forever. And so I, I also have often said to reporters recently that words matter and what, what leaders ma say really matters. And the truth is always right, no matter how painful it might be. So when I hear things like, uh, uh, law enforcement shouldn't have tanks. I don't know any police department that has a tank. None. Now, I, could, I don't know every single police department. So maybe there is one with a tank out there. I'm not sure. But like what has been referred to as a tank in our department is literally a Ford pickup chassis with a bulletproof uh, casing that protects officers. We recently lost one of our officers, Taro Sullivan, that was murdered in our city. The only way we could get to her while the suspect continued fire hundreds and hundreds of high powered rifle rounds at all the officers was that bulletproof non tank. It's not a tank. It has no guns. It's and so I think the truth matters and words matter. And so to your point, though, um, I think when we uh, we have been the recip uh, the receptacle for all things that we lose the ability to handle. So as mental health services go away, send the police. When I was a young officer, we would take uh, people that we would put a mental health hold, a 72 hour hold to a mental health facility. Those all close. Now we take them to ER, probably the worst place to take them. And it takes hours for our officers to sit with them before the hospital staff can come down and treat them. Um, to do a 5150 hold is what we call it in, in California, 72 hour hold. Any officer that graduates from the academy, I graduated when I was 19 years old, um, has the legal authority to put a 32, uh, 72 hour hold on somebody, but mental health professionals do not. So as a officer, and to this day, our officers respond to mental health clinics, to doctors who are calling us to put a hold on their patient, that they're the ones with all the initials and the letters after their name, and yet we're calling a police officer to do that. That has to change. There are mental health calls that we should respond to because there's violence involved, there's potential for violence. But even with those, as soon as we get the violence taken care of, we should be able to have somebody else come and take over that has all those initials after their name. And I'll give one last example. So all of our communities across the country are, are under some sort of health order, some more stringent than others. But here in California and here in Sacramento, we have a health order. And, and I won't get into too many specifics because we don't have any time for that. But it makes everything illegal, what I did as a young person in my community. Go to the park to play basketball, play football in the middle of the street, go to the swimming pool. All those sort of things are misdemeanors 
that put somebody into the criminal justice system. If you lived in our middle class, the upper uh, class, wealthy neighborhoods, the, some of the things that those folks do or, or did when I was growing up are all legal per the health order. Golf is still legal. You could swim in your own pool, obviously. Uh, there was no pools in my neighborhood other than the community pools. You can go hiking in the foothills, but I never did any of those things as a kid. So we just criminalized everything we do in my community that I grew up in. And not to mention in those communities where we have most of the police officers. And I had at every level of government demanding that I send officers and arrest people for a health order. And inevitably it would have been in the poor communities. It would have been largely minority. And at the end of the day, when the statistics came out, we would have said the police officers were racist because they were disproportionately citing people of color. When in reality, the people that created the health order and the laws were not taking that into consideration, nor did they apparently care. And so, uh, the, so we are the enforcement arm of what they did. Needless to say, we didn't cite anybody or arrest anybody for the health order. Thanks, Chief. I heard somebody else wanted to jump in on the question, and then and then we're going to go to uh, audience questions. Audience, if you've got a question, please do um, put it in the chat function, and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. I heard somebody wanted to jump in on this topic. I, I did. Yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to point out that uh, one area where the police could free up a lot of resource, uh, at least in New York at one time, if they've not done so already, is stop and frisk uh, in terms of the number of young people that are approached and uh, are uh, uh, at times seriously disrespected by the police and where you have interactions that uh, wind up being negative involving lots and lots of officers. The number of stops and frisks that grew uh, in New York City uh, until the judge put a stop to them, basically, was appalling. Well, Merrick, that's a, that's a nice segue into the first audience question. So let me just read it verbatim. And anyone who would like to answer this uh, certainly can. Uh, this audience member asks, rather than focusing on bad law enforcement, can we highlight police who are making a positive difference in black neighborhoods? And can we pay higher salaries as well as other rewards for police officers? Anyone? Well, I'll, I'll go with some uh, positive things. And I, uh, the higher salaries, I'm sure the officers would always welcome higher salaries. And I'll just use a, a, for that second part before I get to the first one. Um, there's been a recent uh, movement here in California, and I think it's kind of gone away with some good discussion, but to require all officers to have bachelor's degrees before they even apply to be a police officer. And uh, I think that would be a mistake. Uh, I think that would ha harm our diversity and getting younger people into the police department. Like I say, I started when I was 19. I did not have a bachelor's degree. I have a master's degree now. Um, as opposed to providing incentive pay for a bachelor's degree. Most of our younger officers that are coming on now have bachelor's degrees or soon to get them. And one of the reasons is one, I hope they want a bachelor's degree, but also because they get higher pay for a bachelor's degree. So oftentimes we can accomplish the same things, but with a better method of getting there. Um, in terms of uh, some of the positive things, I think uh, some of the more uh, uh, significant things that happen here in Sacramento, I think, are usually um, partnerships with community organizations. I think uh, a few people on the panel mentioned that, but we have an organization called Brother to Brother here in Sacramento, and they were uh, founded and uh, the vast majority of their members were people that spent a significant amount of time in prison. Well, the founder, Merv Brookins, did 21 years in prison in some of the uh, uh, solitary confinement type prisons like Pelican Bay. And then he got out and he wanted to uh, help the community. So we work very closely with brother to brother. So they come out and talk to every one of our academies about their experience to humanize people that are often called parolees or ex-cons and tell their story and tell how they wanna help and how they wanna work with the police department and work in their communities to keep people from going to prison, but also in out in the neighborhood. So we often now, uh, as we're coming out of COVID have uh, parts of our city that are congregation uh, type areas where young people start 
getting in brawls, like 50, 60, 70 young people just start brawling it out from other neighborhoods. Well, they, we call them, they respond and they, and they do an amazing job of getting that stuff calmed down and taking kids back to their respective neighborhoods so they don't get in trouble or don't get hurt. And the list of those sort of things with brother to brother and a few other organizations are, uh, are, are endless. And it, and it is a transformational in the sense that officers start understanding, I don't necessarily have to take this kid or this adult to jail. I have this other alternative in many cases that I can call them, they'll immediately respond and they and they see the results of that's actually changing this person's life, whereas going to custody often does not. Thanks. I wanna just jump in on that question. Um, Please. Um, because I, my sense is, is that the question sees the critiques, um, which is what this panel was about. And I would um, support what, what Chief Han is saying that in every, in, I, I don't know any law enforcement where there aren't individual law enforcement officers that try to actually make great connections with the community. They understand that relationships are the best part of policing because if you don't have that, then you run into no snitch rules. You can't solve any cases. Nobody tells you anything. So relationships are important and there are individual officers that do that. What I'm commenting on is the structural nature of policing so that you can have um, a, a, a principal in a school that has no resources, that loves those kids to death, tries to get them educated, but they ultimately burn out and the structures ultimately defeat them. And so what we're talking about is making a part of the police culture, the structural nature that we as the citizens say we want to have happen as a part of changing the police culture structurally, rather than having charismatic leaders who spend a tremendous amount of time doing the kinds of things that we would want. And Can that I, just... I think is that I think is what I want to add is the structural nature. It's not that individuals don't do great jobs; they have. Bob, I, if you I could just hear what the chief Alex... said. You could hear what the chief said about the public health order. I mean, he's like, they didn't ask us about that. And now they have us enforcing something that's going to put us at odds with the community. I'm talking about those structural instructions. Let's hear from the chief and then Alex. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to cut Alex off, but I just wanted to say I couldn't agree more with what James just said about the structural uh, uh, systemic type part. Great. Thanks, Alex. I just want to push this in a slightly different direction in terms of how we think about the structural, which is that uh, we've, we're making a mistake, I think, if we, if we believe that the solution to this problem is to try to turn police officers basically into social workers. If we need more social workers, we should just hire social workers. In other words, like what's the value added by having the person who's making decisions about service delivery, about resources, about how to help people, be an armed police officer. Because what, what distinguishes a police officer, and this is kind of my concern with the discourse around community policing, what distinguishes police officers from other parts of government is their capacity, authorization, and, and ability to use violence, that, that coercive power. And that is just too often the wrong tool for addressing our community problems. So we need to be hiring more community organizers, more clinical specialists, more mentors for our young people, more actual social workers, rather than trying to turn police into those things. And let's have police focus on those things that we can't handle in other ways. This next question from the audience, I think is really directed at James. Uh, so I'll let him get, have a first crack at it, but others may have an opinion. Um, our, our country's founding is in racism and imperial capitalism, which is systemic. James, can you discuss how to get people to understand history and facts so they can come up with solutions in this day of disinformation? Um, yeah, I find us to be a totally ahistorical country. Uh, the narrative about everything that I grew up knowing about in school was in direct opposition to my experience as somebody who grew up in Jim Crow in the South. So I mean, it's like, so, so I felt it was incumbent upon me to learn history because what somebody was telling me was not as I was looking around was my existence. 
And so I just, but I, I you know, I think about, um, you know, Richard Reeves' book, Dream Hoarders. I keep saying that this is about social control. And when, and, and, and when you said, Bob, like, well, we're going to talk about race, social control is social control of the other. And so the other in this country has been in days past, Italians, Irish, Eastern Europeans, Catholics, Jews. And so law enforcement has always been, as Chief um, Han has said, has always been that instrument to make sure that the other are in control, are being controlled and not interfering. And so I believe it is up to us, the citizenry, the residents, to come to you like a, as a city council person and say, I want you to explore these things that um, all of us are talking about, whether it's the pros and cons of qualified immunity, how far that goes, whether we're trying to ask police to do too much, um, as Alex suggests, and I'm certainly not trying to say turn law enforcement into social workers. I, I agree with Alex, then we just need social workers, don't have them do that. But that is because we as a society, and I will just say white society, when white folks get scared, there is always hell to pay in terms of laws and enforcement. And that's just that's just the that's just the plain truth. If you look at every oppressive policy, is because somewhere in there, white folks said we need a law to control that this does not happen again. And so until we as the residents demand that we get another kind of way to be safe, and that we are really ready to look at the history in this country of racialized social hierarchy we will continue to just go through replacing what we have and that is and that is instruments of social control and the more we don't see them the better off we feel and the problem is these camera phones are bringing them into our living room and that is what we've asked police to do that we used to didn't see but we said it's okay and so i just think that we have to be informed and have a real conversation about what we feel is okay. What will we sacrifice and what will we not go below to be safe? How are we defining safety? What does crime mean to us? Yeah. Before I give uh, a panelist an opportunity to, to react to, to James, I wanna remind our audience that we've got about 10 more minutes in this panel. And, and so this is your opportunity to get in your last questions. Any reactions to what James just, uh, just said? It was very powerful. Yeah, I, I think the way we know our history is we teach it uh, because we don't teach our history. We teach history, but it, usually it's either flat out not true or a very uh, uh, nice version that doesn't have the whole truth. And um, I, I think all you have to do is look at uh, publishers like McGraw-Hill who publish high school and college textbooks that call slavery uh, immigrant workers to our country. Like that's just flat out not true. And to what James said earlier about uh, cities like San Francisco, we also don't teach the history like in 1964 with Prop 14 that made discriminating uh, in renting or selling homes uh, legal. And that happened in night. Now I wasn't alive in 1964. I was born four years later, but my brother, sister, my parents were all alive and grown. Um, and it passed in San Francisco. It passed by 65% in the state. Over four and a half million people voted for that. And that wasn't that long ago. And so as we look at um, how, do we, how do we move forward, I think the first thing we have to do is know how we got here, which is, is being uh, taught to our history. And uh, lastly, I would just say one of the challenges I think we have in uh, um, changing some of the systemic way we handle things is everybody, and it's not a bad thing, but it's one of the challenges, uh, everybody knows what you get when you dial 911. You get a fairly quick response and you get a response. Call any other number in our society, you don't get a quick response. And it's 24 hours a day. So when we're talking about some of these um, things that happen in society, some of them happen at one o'clock in the morning. And the only response you're getting at one o'clock in the morning is if you call 911. So we have to uh, figure out how do we, if we need more social workers, well, we're gonna need to have social workers maybe more on a model of like law enforcement where they can respond at one in the morning. 
as opposed to going to a voicemail when you need somebody. And so I think that's one of the challenges of why people keep putting things on the law enforcement because they know you call 24 hours a day, you call that number, you're going to get a response. But Chief, that's a, that's a good segue into a question we just got. And here's the question, and is it for anyone. Can social workers or mental health workers become part of the police department? So police identity is not just enforcement, but part of a police community as well. That way, police identity is not negative. In other words, we've taught, we, I think there was consensus on this panel that we should not have police themselves involved in, in social work and mental health. But, but but should these mental health workers become part of the police department? So that's what jump all over that. Yeah, okay. that's what we call a co. That's what we call a co-response model, and that's what some St. Louis is rolling out a co-response model. Uh, but the evidence suggests that the outcomes are really not significantly different than just sending the police. That if you want really different outcomes, you need to send uh, clinicians and outreach workers without police. And the thing is, we have very solid data now that shows that this works. And so what, what the question we want to ask ourselves is what value is added by introducing someone with a gun and a uniform into the dynamic? And one of the things we know about things like domestic violence disputes, mental health crisis, things involving substance use, is that introducing a police officer can actually be incredibly destabilizing because that person does not want to go to jail. Perhaps that person is undocumented. Perhaps that person has had traumatic experiences with law enforcement in the past. Perhaps that person knows that that law enforcement officer might be willing to shoot them and then will provoke exactly such a response. So let's try to find as many ways as we possibly can to take that law enforcement variable out of the equation and focus in on the remaining things that we don't have a clear alternative for. James, before you jump in, because I know you have an opinion on this, um, somebody's asked for you to repeat the title of the book that you mentioned uh, a couple of a couple of uh, moments ago. So if you could start with that uh, book title, and then I know you have an opinion on this one. No, I don't have an. I I don't need to to hammer more about that point. I think that that's what we should be exploring is where are where should police begin and end? Because as Chief Han says, those duties were given to them. They they didn't start there. And so this, 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 this conversation about how this gets more added to the plate is something every locality based on what they do should do, um, should think about and discuss. The book is Richard Reed's book called Dream Hoarders. It's about, I don't, I don't need to say here, that, that's what the, the book is. Great, great. Merrick, we haven't heard from you in a bit. I, you know, we've, we've kind of gone in a, in a slightly different direction. Um, thoughts and reflections on, on what we're talking about now? Mary. Yes, I, 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 you know, I think it's gone on, a, gone in a very good direction, and in a direction that we need to, and that is, uh, what, how can we change the mission of policing to separate it out from the sad history of. Uh, the slave catchers and others who uh, started those functions of the police in the South uh, after the Civil War and uh, reimposed uh, uh, Jim Crow. Uh, that, that's what James is talking about in terms of social control and the like. And we've got to, we've got to move away from that and move away from that kind of model. And that's where I hear Alex, for example, you know, citing a number of very promising and very interesting uh, ways in which that might be done. So I think it ends on a pretty hopeful note. Well, speaking of ending, we're, we're near the end of our time, and, and I want to save the last five minutes here for each of you to make maybe a one or two close, a minute a closing statement, and we'll do that in reverse order than we started. So, um, Alex, why don't you, uh, why don't you bring us home with, with your final thoughts? 
Well, uh, first, just really uh, appreciate the conversation so much and, and the importance of the topic really demands that we have these frank conversations and really explore these issues. But you know, we ha we've had four people on the panel who all agree that there is a problem. We have some disagreements on exactly what the solution is. But what's missing from the conversation is the kind of thin blue line uh, politics that are quite widespread in our country that, that believe that police are the appropriate solution to every problem, that all this talk about police reform is nonsense, that police have done nothing wrong, that, that George Floyd killed himself. And we have to be clear about just how toxic this politics is, how rooted it is in racism, and how politicians who cozy up to the police unions that espouse this kind of rhetoric cannot be our friends and are not doing us any kind of favors by treating them as if they're just another municipal union. They are a chief source of a really toxic racist politics in our society that was abundantly evident on January 6th. Thank you, Alex. Chief, closing statement. Thank you, and I appreciate all the panel members. Uh, this is what we need is people's honest uh, uh, researched and uh, uh, experience that they have. Um, I'll just say this. I, I, I think two uh, huge things would be a, a great start. And one is we have to know our history because it's, it's critical that we know how we got here. Because I hear every day with people who send me letters, emails, social media posts on things that I say, that they're just flat out wrong. And they're not wrong because they want to be wrong. They were, they're wrong because they were never taught this. And so they think a false thing that makes them come to all sorts of false conclusions in my mind. The second thing is we really need to have as a society, uh, a conversation and a lot of work around what do we want law enforcement to do? Because I can tell you, I get phone calls every day that are wanting the exact opposite thing, depending on which phone call it comes. Protest, be harsher, be less harsher, be harsher, be less harsher. And our officers are in the middle of that and our leaders are in the middle of that. And uh, so, I mean, the reality is, at least in my city and my community, and I'm pretty sure it's the same across the country, when we're, a lot of this, uh, a big factor in all of what we deal with is bias and, uh, and, and poverty. Poverty is a big driver of crime. Poverty is a big driver of a lot of things. And the reality is, is economic development in a middle class to upper middle class to a wealthy neighborhood is millions and millions of dollars of a facility, whether it's a sports facility or something like that, that helps build other businesses up in the area. And economic development in a neighborhood like I grew up in is uh, 50,000 or 100,000 to a nonprofit that does amazing work on an individual level, but is not transformative for our entire community. Um, so it's not that those don't need to be done, it's that that's the reality in my community. Just look at where we put our money. It's not in the communities that have been that way. And, th and the other reality is that you'd know if you knew our history is the neighborhood I grew up in, the impoverished crime riddled neighborhood that I grew up in, one was amazing and is amazing community. I wouldn't have chose to grow up anywhere else, but it used to be a wealthy neighborhood. It used to be an upper middle class neighborhood. It was the first suburb of Sacramento. It used to have a full amusement park in the park that I played basketball in every day. And decisions from city and state leaders changed that community through redlining and the building of a freeway. Same thing happened in the Bay Area and other places across the country and turned it into the neighborhood that I grew up in. So if we can, if decisions by people in powerful uh, positions can make communities into what we know them today, we can also make decisions that turn them around and uh, build uh, uh, hope and economic development and those sort of things and change our impoverished neighborhoods to something that we all want them to be. Thank you, Chief. Merrick, your, your final thoughts. I think I pretty much expressed them uh, just a moment ago. And that is, uh, I think we should redouble our efforts to have the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department be active in investigating and going after police departments where there are patterns or practices of police misconduct, including excessive force and race-based policing. 
And uh, I guess I will conclude on that, the importance of that that take place. Thank you, Merrick. James, bring us home, your final thoughts. Yeah, I wanna thank the panelists in this conversation. So I'm, I'm gonna um, end with this, with, the, with just this, some of these thoughts, is that um, a lot of what my colleagues have said have been, are, are true in terms of the structures that we have to deal with. If you think about it, what we have now in terms of what we're asking law enforcement to do, this conversation will be forced upon us as a community and them as an institution. Because if it is about the electeds and the appointeds, um, continuing with this notion of social control in the way that we have had this conversation that reflects in a panel that you're doing at CWA, and there are these conversations going on all over the country. I'm sure my colleagues are being asked to talk all the time. If you were from 2014, the people who graduated from high school since 2014 are majority people of color. For the last three years, every baby, the majority of baby bo babies born in this country are people of color. And so if we don't redefine law enforcement to do what the chief said in terms of how we handle those communities that there's been decisions about disinvestment in, these communities were disinvested in. It didn't just happen. There were decisions made about disinvestment. Until we come to terms with whatever is the impulse to continue to disinvest in communities of color, we are going to have a reckoning because the numbers just don't, the numbers just aren't there. The average age of a Senator is 68. The average voter is 38. There's a reason that Major League Baseball went against Georgia because the average age of a Major League Baseball ticket buyer is 57 years old. That is not your future. Your future is those kids that are graduating from high school that are mostly kids of color. And so we have to actually have a conversation locally about what this means for us as a larger society and how we wanna be kept safe. Because the old rules are not applying and they're not working. And we have to come up with some new ones. And the conversation we had about the new ones is the right conversation. And none of us are always gonna agree but it's the right conversation to be having. Well, thank you, James. That's a nice way to end. I wanna thank our audience for joining us today. Uh, if you enjoyed our discussion, um, please tell your friends that a recording is now available at the CWA YouTube channel. And I wanna offer a special thank you to our four speakers who have volunteered their time to be with us today. If we were doing this live and in person, our audience would be giving you a robust ovation. So you'll have to just accept my thanks on behalf of the audience. Um, and if you'd like to support our speakers audience um, and learn more about their work, you can find their books, uh, podcasts, and social media accounts linked on the CWA website. The CWA, the Conference on World Affairs, relies on the generosity of people like you to make this event possible. Please consider making a gift to the Conference on World Affairs, which can be done at the CWA website, colorado.edu slash CWA. And please do tune in um, later today, tomorrow, and on Sunday for live CWA events, or catch up on those that you miss through on the CWA YouTube channel. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great day. Oh.